Tonight on The Buzz, we are looking at training. We start with Jonathan Amayo, Chief Academic Officer at Keycode Media. His job is to prepare students for careers in the film and television industry. Tonight, we talk with him about how he does it and the benefits of reseller-based training. Next, Jim Malcolm, General Manager for North America for Humanize, recently released education pricing and curricula for their new Views VR cameras. Tonight, he talks about the benefits of training created by developers and where they find students. Next, Ben Kozic is the president and co-founder of Future Media Concepts. Since they started almost 25 years ago, they focused exclusively on training. Tonight, he shares his thoughts on the differences between classroom, conference, and online training. Next, Mac Azadi is the president and COO of Creative Live, a company exclusively devoted to online training for the creative arts. Tonight, Mac shares his thoughts on what it takes to make online training and their instructors successful. All this plus James DeRuvo with our weekly Dottle News update. The buzz starts now. Since the dawn of digital filmmaking, authoritative. One show serves a worldwide network of media professionals. Current. Uniting industry experts. Production. Filmmakers. Post-production. And content creators around the planet. Distribution. From the media capital of the world in Los Angeles, California, the digital production buzz goes live now. Welcome to the Digital Production Buzz, the world's longest running podcast for the creative content industry covering media production, post-production, and marketing around the world. Hi, my name is Larry Jordan. Tonight, we're looking at different ways to provide technology training. This could be in the classroom, at a conference, or online. Training is something I've been deeply interested in for a long time, but there are many different ways that training can be provided by resellers, developers, or independent training companies. There are advantages to each, and tonight we'll talk with representatives from all three groups. As well, we'll look at what they do to make training meaningful to their students. Before we start, though, I want to invite you to subscribe to our free weekly show newsletter at digitalproductionbuzz.com. Every issue every week provides quick links to the different segments on the show, plus articles of interest to filmmakers. Best of all, it's free and comes out every Saturday morning. And now it's time for our weekly Dottle News Update with James DeRuvo. Hello, James big doings today, Larry. I've heard nothing but exciting stuff is going on. What's the news? First off, Nikon announced their new Z-series full-frame mirrorless camera. We've been hearing a lot about it. There's two different models. There's the Z7, which is the professional grade, comes with a 45.6 megapixel full-frame image sensor. The Z6 consumer model, 24.5 megapixel Z6. But the big feature is this massive 56 millimeter Z mount, which has a 16 millimeter flange distance, which translates to over 90% of the available light coming onto the image sensor twice as much as in the Nikon D850. It can shoot 4K video at 30 frames per second, 10 bit color with N log gamma, and 8K time lapse. And it is beautiful. 45 megapixels. Wow. Yeah. So what's your opinion of the camera? Well, the steady streams of breadcrumbs that Nikon laid out to today's announcement kept us all on our edge of our seats. But the announcement of the new cameras didn't disappoint at all, in my opinion. They're rugged like the D850, but they're light. And with that new lens mount, the Z series gets 100% more light than the previous model. This is going to be a great low light mirrorless camera and with 10 bit their own version of Nikon log and with dynamic range I'm betting is going to be around 16 stops it's going to be a great video camera for runners and gunners I'm really excited about it hmm. all right that's Nikon what's your second story 
almost as soon as that was done, DJI had their live announcement to announce their two new Mavic 2 drones. And again, the rumor mill on this one was pretty spot on. Uh, the first one is the Mavic 2 Pro with a one inch image sensor, Hasselblad color science. And then there's the DJI Mavic 2 Zoom with a zoomable 24 to 70 optical zoom lens, the first of its kind in a drone. Uh, new features include professional grade hyperlapse and dolly zoom you know that old alfred hitchcock steven spielberg move where you zoom in with the lens as you're dollying out you can actually do that on a drone now which is really cool hmm. there's uh incredibly improved obstacle avoidance features it, it will automatically recalculate your route you can lock in your course route so you can actually do several passes of the sh camera shot using the course lock feature and a 31 minute flight time with ultra quiet rotors. The word that came to my mind when I was watching the announcement was culmination. This is like the culmination of five years of steady drone development into what I now see as almost the perfect aerial cinematic platform. So that's Nikon and DJI. What's your third story? We got a little bad news is IMAX is pulling back from their virtual reality initiatives. Their partnership with Google to create a virtual reality cinema camera came to a sudden end this week as both companies suspended development. And it's because Google is shifting focus to augmented reality. And without a, uh, a partner, IMAX has to figure out what's going, what they're going to do next. And on top of that, they closed two of their seven virtual reality centers that were located in, uh, in New York and in Shanghai. And the fate of the other five remains unclear. There's one here in Los Angeles, too. And uh, IMAX said that while there was high customer interest in a virtual reality center that's kind of like a, a movie theater meets a uh, meets an escape room type of experience, it just hasn't translated into box office performance. And it's yet another blow to the emerging field, which in my opinion is better served with training and computer gaming. For narrative storytelling, I just continue to be convinced that it's largely a non-starter in virtual reality. Okay, so those are our three lead stories. What are the stories you're following this week? There's a new CFast adapter that will allow shooters to connect their eSATA SSD drives to their Canon C200 or Blackmagic Ursa Mini cameras. We review Blackmagic's DaVinci Resolve 15 and its new visual effects features. Lexa officially restarts media car production across all their lines, and it looks like Canon is going to wait until next year to launch their full-frame mirrorless camera. Gracious, there's no shortage of stuff happening this week. Lots of news. But that's what we're working on. What are you doing tonight? Well, tonight we're looking at training. Online, in-class, vendor training, reseller training, and companies that focus exclusively on training. Well, you know, Larry, as, as uh, we get deeper into technological development, I become more and more convinced that we have to be lifelong students. So I'm really excited about what your show's going to be about tonight. For me, it's a fascinating subject and one that I'm very interested in personally. Some fascinating insights on what training means in today's world of technology. I look forward to hearing it. James, where can people go to learn more about these and other stories on the web? All these stories and more can be found at doddlenews.com, D-O-D-D-L-E-N-E-W-S.com. That's all one word, doddlenews.com. And James Deruvo is the editor-in-chief of Doddle News and joins us every week. We'll see you next Thursday. See you next Thursday. Here's another website I want to introduce you to, doddlenews.com. Doddle News gives you a portal into the broadcast, video, and film industries. It's a leading online resource presenting news, reviews, and products for the film and video industry. Doddle News also offers a resource guide and crew management platform specifically designed for production. These digital call sheets, along with their app, directory, and premium listings, provide in-depth organizational tools for busy production professionals. Doddle News is a part of the Thalo Arts community, a worldwide community of artists, filmmakers, and storytellers. From photography to filmmaking, performing arts to fine arts, and everything in between, Thalo is filled with resources you need to succeed. 
Whether you want the latest industry news, need to network with other creative professionals, or require state-of-the-art online tools to manage your next project, there's only one place to go, dawdlednews.com. Jonathan Amayo is the Chief Academic Officer at Keycode Media. As such, he oversees the growth, strategy, curriculum, government contracts, and students to prepare them for work in the film and television industry. Hello, Jonathan. Welcome. Hi, Barry. Thanks for having me on today. We're delighted to have you. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Tonight, we're looking at training. So let's start at the highest level. How would you define training? Training is advancing your skill set, learning. Well, it, it's said that Einstein said that once you stop learning, you, you begin dying. And as a, an avid learner, I've always believed in higher education. But training is the ability to continue to learn, in my, bit, my opinion, in your career field or in fields of interest that you have. And so I am a, a minor history buff, though I work in the film and in film and TV industry. And on the side, I take classes on, you know, the Byzantine Empire. And so I'm training myself to learn more and more about different parts of history that I enjoy and love. But I also am training myself in the film and TV industry, continuing to better myself, getting my MBA so I understand the structure of business and how to better advance the school system. Um, So training, but it's it's such an interesting time because we now have the emergence of online training and then in-class training, and we obviously see in public schools the shrinking of class, well, the funds for classrooms and the, the beginning of charter schools. And so it, it's a really, it can be a difficult path to navigate to find the right training for yourself. Okay, um, well, let's hold it. Take a breath. You know, I don't want to, you know, give you bad news here, but Key Code Media is a reseller. Why is a reseller interested in training? Well, because we happen to resell to everybody who works in the film and TV industry in Hollywood and actually across most of America. We have offices in Chicago, New York, Seattle, Orange County, and they, for the most part, buy large drastic installs like the city of Burbank, uh, bought a whole installation to record City Hall. KCRW is upgrading their entire uh, radio station. The Santa Monica College is updating their entire infrastructure. And both students and the instructors and professors need to be upgraded and learn how to use the new systems and understand the new workflows. We're in an era for film and TV where we're shifting from broadcast to Internet-based media. And we're also, you know, say peak TV, where there's more content being created than ever, so we need more people who can manage that content and understand how to manipulate it and push it back and forth through the pipeline. But wait a minute, so wait we, a minute, wait, 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 wait. The, you're a reseller. Why doesn't that training fall back to the developer, the manufacturers, the gear? Why does it have to be you? Well, because it, the vendors, in my humble opinion, and I actually worked for Avid and was in their education department for five years, where I actually got my foot really in the door for training my family. My, you know, my aunts and uncles were all teachers and principals, so I think it was in my blood. But when I was hired by Avid, I actually became one of the principal instructors who ran their education program. And, you know, it's funny running at, being on the Avid vendor side and then being actually in the field. The reality of the situation is Avid is not going, or any company is really not going to understand or want to invest in creating very specific classes and education for very specific workflows for very specific parts of the world. Because how we do workflow in Los Angeles, for instance, is different than how they do it in Orlando, Florida, or maybe how they do it in, definitely different than how they do it in London. And the files that we deliver to the studios and how we create those files and who manages those files. And so the vendors, to be nimble, schools built in those areas, you know, Key Code Education is actually the school that I run, and we're a vocational school certified by the state of California, so that means that California has come in to look at our program and make sure that we're offering a legit program, but we're able to both take the vendor classes and blend them with actual practical classes of what the clients or what you're expected to learn when you get in the field. Well, give me, uh, hop, gonna, hop, take a breath again. Give me an example mm-hmm. of the kind of training that you offer. Well, 
Well, we offer all the vocational training for Avid and Blackmagic, all editorial and color correction and audio pro tools. But uh, I was actually going to give you a great example of this is, you know, Avid and Adobe, they all offer a one-on-one class, which is an intro into any of their products, you know, whether it be Media Composer or Pro Tools, and it's how to use certain buttons a certain way. But in reality, when you start out in the film and TV industry in Los Angeles, if you're an editor, for instance, you're more than likely going to start off as an assistant editor, which means you need to know how to use very particular buttons in a very particular way. And it's some of it's covered in the 101 and some of it's covered in later classes, but it's not all assimilated and put together in a way where you can digest it to understand these are the roles and this is what I need to know in order to accomplish that role. So we've developed classes like assistant editing for assistant uh, for a scripted or non-scripted productions. And that's just one example of... We have the Avid 101 class, but then actually a lot more popular class is the, the AE class because most people who need an intro class, they're, they're breaking into the industry. And so, um, and this actually goes into another part of the conversation with e-learning. I, I deal with a lot of students who are both working professionals or cross-training um, who have always wanted to work in the film industry and don't necessarily have a massive budget to retrain themselves like they did when they were 18 years old and could get student loans, um, where we spent $100,000 on our college education. Um, and so in our world of training, we get a little bit more nitty-gritty, and I usually judge the student uh, and try to also make them aware of their ideal self versus their practical self, meaning we all ideally think we can watch videos online and learn anything we want. Um, but the reality is most of us have significant others, children, and we have to go to our work, and we're tired when we get home. And so the actual sitting down and educating yourself online, it becomes very difficult for most people. Um, I actually just had a Now, Jonathan, hold up, take a breath again. So, There's, there is so much free training available, and our so time much. is so short. Why, does, why, is there, why should somebody ever pay to get trained in a classroom? Because you can't actually always get what you want online. And I have discovered this painfully. But more importantly, it comes down to time. And what I usually inform a student is that they have to dedicate time in order to, whether it's online or in person. And that is always the biggest first hurdle that everyone has is, you know, regardless of how we present the information, it's finding the time to take away from their profession and convincing their employer that, it's worth their time to advance their skill sets. But the reason why inline education or, or classroom-led education to me it has its advantages is because you have typically a highly trained instructor who can adapt the information based on the students. You know, I have, I'm certified to teach a whole lot of classes, and I have given AVID classes to you know, WNBC in, in, in Washington and a post facility here in Hollywood, and it's a radically different class, even though it's a diff- the same book. Um, because I understand that broadcast editors need to adapt the information and that their workflow is radically different than somebody who's cutting for NBC, you know, eight, you know, 8 o'clock sitcom TV shows. And more importantly, complex ideas are rarely, rarely uh, uh, translated properly through e-learning. I find that you can usually pick up grand schemes, but really putting it all together. A good example of this would be uh, Cisco certifications or any of the advanced certifications you can get in the computer industry. They typically all require a class at some point because all that information is free for you to watch, but putting it together at some point and having somebody say, this is how it works all together is is really hard to find. It's typically and those people who Jonathan, have that ability. again, hope, take a breath. For people that want more information about the training that KeyCode offers, where can they go on the web? KeyCodeEducation.com. That's all one word, key, K-E-Y, code, C-O-D-E, KeyCodeEducation.com. And Jonathan Amayo is the chief academic officer at KeyCode Media. Jonathan, thanks for joining us tonight. Thanks for having me, Larry. Bye-bye. Jim Malcolm is the general manager for North America for Humanized Technologies. 
He's responsible for managing the VIEWS VR camera product ecosystem, and he also sits on the board of directors for the Consumer Technology Association. Hello, Jim. Welcome back. Hey, thanks for having me. It's, uh, it's great to be here. Jim, tonight we're talking about training. And the last time we talked, just a few months ago, you told us about your new education initiative. What is it? So what we launched is the Humanize VR Horizons program, which is a program that's designed to put VR technology in the hands of students and teachers at all levels of education. Why the focus on students and not media professionals? Because as we look at the students that are in the classroom today, they are going to be the professionals and the executives in the future. So giving them the foundation to be able to bring new imaging tools into the corporations that they join is really a fundamental core of our project. Where is your training being used? Training right now is being incorporated into major universities, elementary schools, um, really across the board. And it's uh, you know a wide spectrum of use within those institutions, anything from, say, example, a journalism school to communications in uh, uh, marketing communications, uh, all the way into healthcare and IT sciences. And is there a cost involved? There is. We've steeply discounted the price of the cameras themselves. Certainly, we'll share as much information as we can, but we really want to encourage schools to actually buy into either a single camera or multiple cameras. So under our program, the Views camera, which is normally a $799 price point, a student can buy as little as $599, and a school or university can purchase kits of five for as little as $499 a camera. So really, for about $2,500, a school can pick up about, uh, well, five cameras and all of the support on the back end to really launch a VR program at their school. Tonight, we're looking at three types of training, classroom training, online training, and what I call vendor-generated or vendor-specific training. Vendor training, it seems to me, is a two-edged sword. Nobody knows your product better than you do, but it's also easy for that training to shift more toward marketing. How do you balance between the two? This whole world of visual communication in virtual reality is really changing how we approach. And as a vendor or as a manufacturer, right, we look at both classroom learning as well as online learning and how do we bridge those two. And using VR technology, an educator in the classroom or quite frankly, not even a classroom, it could be an organization like an airline or a company like BP that's putting oil derricks out at sea. These are areas where maybe I have to train in a classroom environment, but I could actually record and capture that so that I could distribute that real world experience out in an online experience in the future. So what are the goals of your training? What are you trying to accomplish? It's really about how do we prepare the next generation of communicators or trainers to be able to leverage today's technology in order to train differently in the future. Uh, there's been a ton of studies done about how virtual reality or full immersion in a VR headset helps with learning, um, re retention of knowledge, and the ability to experience things that otherwise would be out of reach. And so being able to create those worlds and create that content so that we can provide an valuable assets to corporations in the future is, uh, is kind of the core of what we've built. What are you seeing the students are interested in learning? I assume that you have a variety of different programs available. Is there one that's more popular or a subject that they seem more interested in than another? That's a great question. The, the, the pendulum swings really far. And I, I think it's first it's important to realize that in, in, until now, right, virtual reality content creation was largely created by computer programming. And, you know, there's a certain amount of students, a certain uh, personality, if you will, of the students who are willing to take that IT space that want to be computer programmers and recreate the world around them digitally. But when we look at the students that are in things like journalism or marketing and communications or, um, quite frankly, education segments, these students are more interested in making a difference, right? Whether it's moving a consumer through a purchase funnel in the, in the communication piece or reporting on the, what's happening in the world around them in something like journalism. So 
VR really empowers that non-tech student, and I say that with a little hesitation because there's still a lot of tech involved in this, um, but that non-programming type student to be able to access and leverage technology to tell their stories in new ways. Is it your experience that the students who are entering training have already decided that they want to pursue VR, or are they taking the training because they're interested in learning more and trying to decide what they want to do? It mostly starts with the desire to be within a certain discipline, right? So let's pick on, I don't know, let's pick on journalism since I brought that one up a, a little bit earlier. So you have journalists, uh, students in journalist programs throughout the country who are interested in journalism. They're not necessarily uh, looking to become a media expert or a film producer or anything like that, right? They, they love the idea of producing journalistic pieces, when you interject the technology into that, and I'll use the example of the University of Oklahoma, the Gaylord School, um, there's a couple of uh, Emmy Award winning professors that are there, Kathleen Johnson and uh, Mike Botcher, and they've both incorporated the views camera into their uh, curriculum so that you're learning the basis of uh, journalism, but you're given a tool to tell that story in a different way. So, no, they're not coming in saying, hey, I want to learn about VR. They're coming in saying, hey, I want to be the best journalist I can, and how does this tool help me do that better? So they're really viewing VR as a communications tool. You get back to that pendulum on how far it swings, right? So there are some people who look at VR strictly as a gaming platform, an entertainment property, um, you know, in that kind of narrow sense then, all right, it takes a certain uh, mindset to get there. But if you do, if you think about it more as a communication means, and I think I've said this before on your show, if you think about a VR headset as being a fourth screen, right? We have the TV in our living room, the computer on our desk, the mobile phone in our hand, and a near field screen of this VR headset. If you start to create and figure out what is the best way to tell a story for that near field screen, what type of resolution do I need? What type of frame rates? What type of story uh, components actually build that and engage people? Then you're well on your, on your path. And quite frankly, that applies to many different verticals. Which leads directly into the tools that we use to create this communication. And recently you offered a new Views VR camera. Tell me about this. What hardware is available to help us tell stories using VR? Yeah, so recently Humanize launched something called the Views XR. And what this is is kind of a, it's a, what we refer to as a dual experience camera. This is something that in its closed state is nothing more than a simple 360 degree camera like many that are in the market today. But when you push a button on it, uh, the two lenses kind of pop out and they become side by side. So they mimic the human eyes and the camera converts into a 180 degree VR video. In other words, it's got 180 degree field of view, um, 3D VR video. And so we think this type of technology is really gonna help the storyteller extend from, hey, I wanna capture the world around me, to how can I do a framed experience in true VR that helps me tell my story better? And that's, and that's the Views XR. And for people that want more information, where can they go on the web? The easiest way to find us is go to views.camera, and it's V-U-Z-E dot camera. No need for the dot com, and that will take you right to uh, to the landing page. That website is four letters, V-U-Z-E, views.camera, and Jim Malcolm is the General Manager for North America for Human Eyes Technology. And Jim, thanks for joining us today. It's a pleasure being here. Thanks much. In 1994, Ben Kozich co-founded Future Media Concepts along with Jeff Rothberg. At the time, FMC became the world's first AVID authorized training center. Today, as president, Ben oversees a curriculum that includes Adobe, Apple, Autodesk, AVID, and NewTek. Hello, Ben. Welcome. Hello there, Larry. Good to be here. Tonight on The Buzz, we're looking at training. How would you describe Future Media Concepts' approach training well training um, has gone through a certain revolution or restructuring uh, in the past few years with all the recorded training and the free training that is available online 
at least for post-production training, which is actually software training. You may ask, how can we be in the paid to attend business while there's so much free online? That is actually one of my questions. I'm interested in your answer. Go ahead. <laughs> well, first, let me say this. We cater to both flavors. I mean, our training centers uh, nationwide offer our training uh, courses, either as an in-class experience or online interactive live that you can attend from everywhere. So we're not going one way, we're going both way. But here's what's interesting. If one goes to YouTube to look for any training, let's take Adobe Premiere, obviously you're gonna get dozens and dozens of pages of results. Yes, they're free. Yes, they're good. Some of them are even done by my trainers who I value so much. So why pay a dollar to go somewhere else? Well, we found out over the past few years that there are a few reasons why people elect to come to pay training. Number one is curation of content. Let's assume you found all these clips, which one should you start with? And once you watched it, and let's assume it was great, what's the natural progression? Logically, what's the next one? Obviously, you don't know. And people say, you know, too much. I don't know where to go. So when they come to FMC, content is curated and you sit for a day or three, depending which class you attend. And we lead you through a logical progression. So that's one reason say, yes, it's free on YouTube, but I got lost. Second reason for paid classroom training is self-discipline. Let's assume you had all these clips sorted out on your desktop. In the way we live today, it's very hard to find a person who can play those clips and watch it for two days without any interruption. And people tell us, listen, I realize that I got to pay, come to the class, shut my phone, dig in and learn it properly. So there are two communities out there, those who swear by online training, why would I ever leave my bed? And some who says, you know what, yes, it's out there, but I prefer, this is the tool that I thrive on. This is how I make my living. That's not the time to, to save on $1,000, no disrespect to the amount, but I'm going to make a living of it. Let me learn it right. In a way, one can say that you can see young versus more mature users, where the young who are more budget, budget conscious, naturally looking for the recorded solutions like Linda or free on YouTube. And those who are a little more established, even though sometimes the company paid for them, Let's assume $1,000 for a class, and they can choose whether to take it online or in class. They choose in class. Future Media Concepts has expanded from your single training center back when you started to include training on the road. I mean, we're talking to you now from a hotel in Austin or where you create training at events such as NAB. Why the move beyond your traditional training center? We just realized that some people prefer to get their education in some kind of an annual event and a conference settings. One main difference between classroom learning and conference learning is that in the classroom, it's a small group, four to eight clients with one instructor and one topic. And when you learn uh, at a conference, you enjoy a variety of uh, parallel rooms that are happening and you can jump on and see a little bit of After Effects and a little bit of Premiere, a little bit of creativity sessions or business sessions. Our conferences are designed for people with at least kind of two to five years experience, kind of intermediate level, and they do not need the hands-on so much. They are hands-on all day. They want to sit back and see the gurus teaching them tips and tricks. And if we make the conferences projection style, meaning a frontal presentation, not hands-on, there's so much more material that we can cover. One of the things that you're known for is your instructor-led training, whether it's instructor-led in a classroom or at a conference or even online. What do you look for in an instructor? The main thing we're looking for with instructors is they're not only academic teachers, but they also have real working experience. So instructors are working professionals who also went through the train-the-trainer by the vendor being Adobe or Blackmagic or Apple. So they bring a mix of the theoretical knowledge and war stories, real war stories into the classroom. What do you say to older students who are concerned that they just won't be able to learn all this new stuff? 
Well, having been in training for over 20 years, I've seen uh, many, many uh, cycles where people didn't jump on the next wave and they got booted out of the industry. Unfortunately, it's not my recommendation that you focus on one tool. Today, a little bit of a Houdini's, you know, behind the uh, workstations, people that can tell the story, do the graphics, tweak the audio, a little bit of car correction and compress it for online delivery. So I would say to those folks, hey, I'm sorry, you got to keep, uh, stay on top. If you stick to your story, like, you know, I'm only doing anything, but I'm not getting into color correction, even though the software can do it, you may find yourself uh, a little bit behind on your career. So continuous training. Unfortunately, it's there. There's no uh, dull moment. There's never a plateau in this industry. So not because I'm in training. Yes, that's my best recommendation because you'll find yourself being booted out somehow of the industry. A friend of mine many, many years ago, when we were just starting out in the industry, would turn to me one time and said, when will I stop learning and start doing? And the answer actually is never. You're always learning. It's kind of interesting phenomena where the training costs multiple of the cost of the software. Mm -hmm. uh, it used to be when we started that Avid system was $75,000 and then you happily spend, you know, $2,000 on training. Today, uh, I don't know, Resolve is a free download and Adobe Creative Cloud is $300 a month. And then the training is uh, much more expensive. So the training is more than the software. But the software is very in features. Users keep pushing the vendors. As a result, users are training all the time. There are many reputable training companies out there. Why should someone consider FMC? One differentiation is being the authorized channel. We are the authorized channels for Apple, every black match, or that's all the names you mentioned. It doesn't mean that the others are no good, but it means that when you go to an authorized training center, quality is guaranteed because the trainers are certified and, you know, the... Uh, the class uh, has the top uh, line equipment and latest software and all of that. So sometimes, uh, often, training managers or human resource managers at TV stations or studios want to send few people for training. They want to send them once and make sure that it's good. So they'll be looking for the authorized. We are the only one-stop shop for all these technologies. There are many other training centers that will focus on different areas, like an Apple training center or Adobe. And uh, with FMC, it's a one-stop shop that can provide training on all aspects of production all the way to post-production. That's the differentiation. And for people that want to learn more about the training that Future Media Concepts offers, where can they go on the web? The website is fmctraining.com. You see all the annual events that we produce. That website is all one word, fmctraining.com, fmctraining.com. And Ben Kozich is a co-founder and president of Future Media Concepts. And Ben, thanks for joining us today. Always a pleasure, Larry. It's my honor to be here. I want to introduce you to a new website, Thalo.com. Thalo is an artist community and networking site for creative people to connect, be inspired, and showcase their creativity. Thalo.com features content from around the world with a global perspective on all things creative. Thalo is the place for creative folks to learn, collaborate, market, and sell their works. Thalo is a part of Thalo Arts, a worldwide community of artists, filmmakers, and storytellers. From photography to filmmaking, performing arts to fine arts, and everything in between, Thalo is filled with the resources you need to succeed. Visit Thalo.com and discover how their community can help you connect, learn, and succeed. That's Thalo.com. Mac Azadi is the president and COO of Creative Live, which is the largest online education platform focused on creative skills, entrepreneurship, and soft skills. Hello, Mac. Welcome. 
Hi, Larry. Thanks for having me. I know I just summarized the company in my intro, but how would you describe Creative Live? I think that's it. One of our points of differentiation is by being focused on some specific areas of the market versus very broad online education, like a lot of, a lot of other folks are. And so we think by focusing specifically in either the creative space or people that are trying to figure out how to make a living and a life following whatever their passion is, we can build a better sense of community as well as kind of focus more on getting the, the best instructors in those spaces. Early in the program, we've spoken to several companies that provide face-to-face in-class training. Why did Creative Live decide to focus on online? Obviously, there's a ton of value in face-to-face and in, in personal in-class training. One of our core values is access, and so the idea of doing it digitally and doing it online provides significantly more access to people that might not otherwise have the ability to learn from best pros in the space, like a Larry Jordan, uh, around whatever their whatever their their area of interest is. And so, doing it online, obviously, it's it's a lot more scalable, and it enables us to give more people access to to more interesting instructors. Well, I've had the pleasure of creating training for Creative Live in the past, and you run a great team. Well, thank you. But your approach to training is different from most other online titles. At least in my experience, your training sessions run longer, and you have a live audience. Why the differentiation? That's exactly right. So the live audience, the idea behind the live audience is really twofold. Both stems around engagement. So uh, folks in your audience that have that have taken online classes before, it can feel very lonely is one of the things we've heard from our students and that it's just a guy talking to a camera and you feel like you're watching a guy talking to a camera. Our idea with the, the folks in the audience is it gives the instructor someone to talk to. So it's more engaging for the instructor. And then the participant is the online participant. You feel like you're part of something because you're part of a class and the instructor is engaging with people. And so it's, it's more engaging. And then having a live audience enables the, the folks that are in the audience to ask questions, which more often than not are questions that the folks that are the, in the Internet audience are thinking about as well. And so it adds a secondary level of, of training and uh, education that you don't get when it's just a person talking to a camera. The other benefit is if the in-studio audience is falling asleep, the instructor, not that it would ever happen to me, but the instructor knows that they maybe need to pick up their act a little bit to keep people from nodding off. That's right. What do you look for in the subjects you've covered? You you mentioned that you want to focus on a, a range of subjects, not cover the waterfront. So where's your main focus? So the focus started with being around folks that are trying to figure out how to either follow their passion in some sort of creative art or make a living in a creative art. So we started with with video and photography, which is how we got introduced to you, with craft and maker, art and design, and audio and music. And then what we what we started to see was that there are a lot of places that people are learning the craft, but there are very few places where people are learning how to make a living and a life following their craft. So you can learn how to become a photographer or a designer but then it's, there's a whole other component to going out and getting clients or to learning how to do billing or learning to how to be a good conversationalist. And so we started building these classes called Money and Life, which is all about how to make a living and a life. And then it turns out that all these skills that you need to be a creative entrepreneur are skills that you need to be a great entrepreneur no matter what, which are also skills that you need to be a great employee or just a, a better human. And so We've really been focusing a lot on this, what we call money in life, which are the the soft skills and emotional intelligence areas. I guess the short answer is we focus on those five segments of craft, and then we also focus on a lot around just how to become the person that you want to be. It will not come as a surprise to you when I say that media is a really hard business to earn a living in these days. Yes. Are you finding your students are mostly hobbyists, or are you finding your students are mostly professionals? Yeah, it's very interesting. Our student mix is so broadly split that it's almost useless from a demographic standpoint. Hmm. 30% of our students are hobbyists. 30% of our students are people that have a W-2 but make some money from their passion on the side. And 30% of our students are professional creatives and make their living following whatever their passion is. So it's a very broad mix of folks. I think actually the uh, you know me- media is a difficult way to make a living these days, but I think be- that it's easier to get into media, and because of the the prevalence of of media tools, there are more people that are actually interested in getting into it than had been in the past. Uh, and so 
it's harder to make a living, but it's easier to try to make a living. And so uh, I think that the, the, the size of the market has actually grown. I think I agree with that in that we have more people creating media than ever before and more avenues of distribution than ever before. That's right. But it's harder to earn a living in the market. That's right. I think that's right. What makes for a successful online instructor? As you know, Larry, it's different teaching online to a, a broad internet audience than it is to teaching to a class. And so I think what we look for in particular is one, people that bring a certain amount of credibility. So we're looking for people that have done this uh, professionally or who think that come with credibility because I think it's important to learn from people that you're inspired by versus just a random person who knows how to do something. Uh, and so we look for people that are inspirational, that come with credibility. Uh, and that understand that our thought process around learning is that there's the craft to it, but really we're, we all want to learn because of the end result, not because you want to learn how to use this slider, but because you want to have amazing photos of your kids or take amazing photos of the wedding that you've been hired to do or make great music for your friends. So for us, the instructors are people that can relate the, the, the outcome to the craft and obviously, like you said, doing it online is different. It, it takes a different level of, of energy to, to try to get that energy through to the Internet audience. And so uh, somebody that can, that can carry that energy and that, that can, that's comfortable talking to a small room but knowing that there are tens of thousands of people actually watching you all over the world, which surprisingly is, is uh, more tiring and more daunting than you would think. I have to echo that comment. Uh, I love teaching in front of groups of people. Face-to-face -face training is a favorite of mine. And I also love doing online training. And I am far more tired after an online session <laughs> right. than after any face-to-face -face session. It is amazing how much energy that takes. Yeah, yeah. The Internet is awash in free training. Why should someone pay to get trained? Yeah. Well, it's a wash in two types of training. One is pieces of training. Uh, you can go to YouTube and you can learn how to use a slider in, in Photoshop or learn how to use a specific brush in Photoshop. But if you want to learn how to use Photoshop from beginning to end, then it's up to you to go and kind of dig it up. It's a lot of work. And then two, you don't, it's a wash in, uh, in, in training in either free or cheap training from just completely random people. And so uh, you don't actually know who you're learning from and, and what the quality of the instruction is. I think the value of paying for better training, whether it's on Creative Live or somewhere else where you're learning from professionals is, one, you can decide what level you are and how much you want to learn. And so you, you, you get that the, the, full, the, the full component of it versus um, having to, to get it in bits and pieces. And two, you, you know that the person that, that you're learning from has credibility. There's a different level of trust that you can attribute to what you're learning. I do think there's a ton of value in the free training if you're just trying to learn a specific tactic from a specific tool or just learning, you know, whatever it is, how to fix red eye. That has its place. Um, the breadth and depth of it, there's value in, in, in paying for it. There are a lot of training companies out there, and many of them are quite reputable. Why should someone consider attending Creative Live? The few reasons that we've that we've talked about briefly here, the one is just our area of focus. We're focused on creativity and people skills and, and emotional intelligence and entrepreneurship. And I think because of that, it it's easier to find what you're looking for. And most importantly, you get to be with your people. If you think about college, for example, obviously there's a lot of value in sitting in the classroom and learning from the from the teacher. But the majority of the value doesn't come from that component of the experience. It comes from being around your people, learning from your peers the conversations you have with the instructor afterwards, going to seminars where you learn about how these things are applied. And we do all of those things here at Creative Live. So we have free classes that you can watch that are not necessarily about the tactics of how to do the thing, but but where you get to learn from Richard Branson or Mark Cuban about how they think about entrepreneurship. And then, and again, being focused on, on this, specific, this specific area, the community is of people that are going through the same things. And so, it, so whatever you're going through doesn't have to feel quite as alone an invite only platform. So we go out and we find folks that are the best of the best. Um, and, and we ensure that, that both the quality of the instructor and the quality of the instruction is great. Uh, and then we produce all of our own content. And so like you said, Larry, it's, uh, it's in front of an audience. It's, it's, it's highly engaging. It's all in HD and it's on multiple platforms. So you can, you can enjoy it wherever you are, whenever you'd like. For people that want more information about Creative Live, where can they go on the web? You can find us at 
www.creativelive.com. That's all one word, C-R-E-A-T-I-V-E, creativelive, L-I-V-E, dot com. And Mac Kazadi is the president and COO of Creative Live. And Mac, thanks for joining us today. Thanks so much, Larry. You know, I was just thinking, the world of training, like the world of media, is in upheaval today. Training is everywhere. (laughs) I know since I've contributed more than my fair share. There are articles and videos scattered all across the web. Much of it is free. Some of it is not. There's training from different sources, developers, resellers, individuals, and independent companies. We are drowning in a sea of of instructions. I have hundreds of videos on YouTube and thousands of written tutorials on my website. If all you want to learn is how to do a particular task, that's easy to find. The hard part, and where many people stumble, is learning why to do something, or whether you should even do it at all. This requires an understanding of the fundamentals behind a task, and that is much harder to locate on the web. There's nothing wrong with free training, but it is scattered, of uneven quality, and task-specific. This is why one of Ben Kosich's comments struck me so forcefully. When I asked him the benefit of paid training, he replied that it is curated. It is organized, focused, and designed with a specific goal in mind. Paid training, when done well, starts at the beginning and takes you on an extended journey that illustrates how and why to make the most of an entire piece of software, not just solve a particular task. There are many sources of good training, as we discovered tonight, though I'm partial to the independent voices, probably because I am one myself. I was also impressed with how Creative Live has emulated the traditional classroom in their online training. Live students in the room, dynamic audience questions, and sessions that are long enough to allow students to concentrate on and learn about a subject in detail. Why emulate a classroom? Because that's where all of us grew up, and we know how that works. The pressures on training parallel the pressures on media. Tools are getting cheaper, budgets are getting smaller, and there's more competition than ever. But the need for high-quality training has never been higher. More people than ever need help. The trick for us instructors is to figure out how to make a living helping you learn how to master a new technique or new piece of software. Like making a movie, this is an interesting conundrum. Just something I'm thinking about. I want to thank our guests for this week. Jonathan Amayo with Key Code Media, Jim Malcolm with Humanize, Ben Kosich with Future Media Concepts, Mac Azadi with Creative Live, and James DeRuvo with Dottlenews.com. There's a lot of history in our industry, and it's all posted to our website at digitalproductionbuzz.com. Here you'll find thousands of interviews, all online and all available to you today. And remember to sign up for our free weekly show newsletter that comes out every Saturday morning. Talk with us on Twitter at DPBuzz and Facebook at DigitalProductionBuzz.com. Our theme music is composed by Nathan Doogie Turner, with additional music provided by SmartSound.com. Our producer is Debbie Price. My name is Larry Jordan, and thanks for listening to the Digital Production Buzz. The Digital Production Buzz is copyright 2018 by Thalo, LLC. 